Isaiah. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for you to share these three strategies for leading equity in education. So I'm going to cut my mic and turn my video off and I have my pen ready and I'm ready to learn. Thanks so much for sharing with us today. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for having me. It is um, an honor and uh, just an absolute delight to be here with all of you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's been a rough few months. I think we can all relate to that. And uh, even uh, as I sit here and present from the comfort of my own home, um, it, is, uh, it takes a lot of getting used to. Uh, as a leader, whether you are a site leader, a district leader, a classroom leader, um, instructional leader, uh, we have to come to terms with the fact that the students who left us prior to the COVID closures and prior to uh, the marches for justice are not the same students, are not the same stakeholders, community that we are going to come back to in the fall. We have changed. Um, and so we have to take that into account. And as leaders, uh, we are charged uh, with changing the way we teach, the way we learn, and that depends on the way we lead. And so um, I have a sense of urgency about it. I know that you do as well. Um, and just getting comfortable with all of that uncertainty. Uh, people are looking for guidance and are looking to leaders, not only for leading change, but for leading healing. And there is a lot of healing to do. Uh, I'd like to begin by sharing with you a little bit about myself. Uh, so let me go here. Oh, first of all, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Bell, for sharing that with um, the group. Uh, but just in case you are not connected, I urge you to hop on Twitter, get connected. Uh, please, uh, if you'd like, uh, follow me at, at Rosa Isaiah. I also host a chat focused on leadership through a social justice and equity lens. And I think this may be our fifth year, if not our sixth hour, meaning me, myself, and I. Um, and it, it I, I tell you, this is my 27th year as an educator, and I have learned more as a connected educator from other people um, than I had, you know, prior to uh, becoming connected. So uh, please do take a look at it if you haven't. And if you have any questions, of course, you're welcome to email me. That's my personal email, and I would be happy to connect with you. Uh, just a quick overview, because I think this is really important. Storytelling is so powerful, and I'm not going to share with you my life story, um, but I do want to highlight some important points about my journey, and I do because it, it all has influenced and created the person, the leader that I am today, and I'm thankful for those opportunities. Uh, it also has allowed me to connect with my community, my students, uh, and my parents in a different way. So um, uh, my journey began uh, years ago. Uh, I came to this country as a four-year-old from Mexico. I am uh, an English learner, and I still am an English learner. I learn something new every day. And um, I grew up in, in some challenging um, environments. Uh, I grew up in poverty. Um, I've dealt with uh, adverse childhood experience and, and trauma like many of our students have. Uh, but through it all, I, I really was influenced by teachers. And I was influenced by the relationships I had with the people in my school community. And uh, as a result, uh, I am one of eight kids. I'm the only one who graduated from college I'm a first-gen student, uh, proud of that. And um, once I started, I couldn't stop. So I am Dr. Rosa Isaiah. 
and uh, very proud of that and happy to share those experiences uh, as a leader with others. The reason I believe that people like me uh, are here is not only the support of your family, uh, but the support of a healthy culture, a school community, leaders and teachers who are believers. I am a big fan of Dr. Anthony Muhammad's book, and he talks a great deal about the believers in a school. Um, I had a number of people along my trajectory, and 99% of those experiences were really positive. Going back to kindergarten, and uh, my teacher, Mrs. Yamaguchi, who I didn't understand a word she said, but she smiled and she was a sweetheart. Um, and, and then uh, Senora de la Peña in first grade, who for the first time made me feel visible and valued as a child who, who was a newcomer and felt completely lost and in culture shock. Um, she held an after school program, uh, Escuelita, she called it, and she taught me to read in my primary language. And she sounded like me and she looked like me and she taught me to read and write in Spanish. And it completely changed who I was. Uh, contributed so much to my confidence and my goals. Even as a first grader, I knew that I wanted to be able to do that for others who, who were like me. And uh, I stay in touch with Señora de la Peña, and I'm so grateful for that experience. Um, and, and throughout my middle and even my high school years, um, as a first generation student and a newcomer, even as 11th, 12th grader, I wasn't sure if I would uh, be able to go to college. Um, I would have been consider considered a dreamer at that time, so it was uh, financially not feasible. Uh, and uh, Mrs. Clear was uh, a 12th grade uh, leadership teacher and assistant principal, and uh, we weren't super close, but she shared with me her story and her story sounded like my story. And at that moment, I decided, you know, this is a possibility. And I decided to go to college. And although it took me six and a half years to get my bachelor's degree, I knew that I was de determined to do it. Um, and the rest is history. So just um, a little bit to emphasize how important it is to share our stories. They matter, they count. Today more than ever, it is important for students like me to see, si se puede, it's possible. Yes, we can. Um, taking a look at this, um, I blued out or grayed out part of this frame here because it's a very popular narrative that uh, many of us have seen. And so we have on my left, um, the reality, which is inequity, right? Uh, and then we have uh, next to that, the second frame, equality. I want to um, challenge you to think about moving beyond that, moving even beyond equity into a social justice perspective and uh, the mindset of liberation. And I'll talk more about that, but um, this explains it beautifully there with those images. So let's look at this section here. Now we have um, equity and liberation as an option. Um, and when you look at this, I want you to think a minute about how, how do we get here? Or how did we get here? How did we get to a point where equity hasn't always been the goal? Um, the most frustrating thing as a leader for change, as a teacher for change, is noticing that not everybody sees inequity as an issue. 
uh, and are, are not encouraged to create change. But where did that in our history uh, begin? And as we look at the goal of social justice, where all people are provided equal opportunities to succeed, and those that don't have the same um, tools are provided with the tools and the access to those tools to be able to achieve. Um, how do we uh, go back to that vision and really create um, systems that allow for that to happen? So as we look at as education as a whole, um, I think most of us understand that um, we have we have been indoctrinated into a system that hasn't worked for all students, for all people. And so are we just products of that system or are we willing to uh, disrupt a system that maybe didn't begin with equity as the goal? but that now we know that we can get to equity and get beyond that to a socially just and a liberated um, learning um, environment for all kids. And so it's a different take on these images. I prefer this image because why don't we just get rid of the dang wall? Um, has the wall always been there? And it, or have we built it? Have we uh, created a, a taller, stronger wall as we move along? Um, this is the time, if any time in history, we've had an opportunity to create change and dismantle or disrupt and uh, get rid of walls, this is it. So what are the strategies? I talked about a few strategies. And as I was reflecting on you know, what is my role? There was this, this huge sense of now what? what? What can we do beyond what we've done before? For some people, this work uh, to create equity and access and justice in our systems is not new work. It's work that um, perhaps people have been doing for a while. But something about this moment feels very different. It feels very different. And it, it goes beyond the occasional tweet and the selling of books because, I mean, there is so much out there, so much great stuff to read, right? So how do we move beyond that? How do we move beyond the learning? And it's almost paralyzing, right? It's paralyzing. If you're new to, to the work, it is especially scary. Um, saying the wrong thing, being uncomfortable, dealing with discomfort. Um, and what made sense to me is that for so many years, we've danced around creating comfort around these conversations. Uh, I did as well. How do I get my teams, my teachers, my principals comfortable with a discussion, an honest conversation about injustice and inequity? And I spent a lot of time on creating a sense of comfort in the room. And I realized recently that it's an unattainable goal that we will always have that discomfort, that not everybody will wanna get there or attempt to get there. And so it's just really time to dive in. Acknowledge, state, yes, we're gonna have that discomfort. Let's move on and let's dive in. Um, so I'm not saying do, don't do any work around that piece. Um, call it out, acknowledge it, but we have to move beyond uh, making people comfortable, uh, preparing people, grooming people to be comfortable and to have uh, conversations and into, yes, it's uncomfortable. Lives literally depend on creating uh, more just and equitable systems 
So we're going to embrace that and we're going to do that together and we're going to jump in. So that is part of that first strategy, acknowledging. Acknowledging that we have inequity, acknowledging that we have injustice, um, that racism exists and that if it hasn't happened to you, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, it's there. Um, that uh, children of color have been treated differently for many, many years. And if we connect that to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, we have conversations uh, about all lives mattering. And yes, yes, all lives matter, we acknowledge that. Uh, the reality in our systems, in our country, is that uh, Black lives have mattered less. And so it's not about taking away from any one group, um, but it's really enhancing um, the conversation and addressing it so that every group has those same uh, learning opportunities. Um, we also have to acknowledge that uh, we all have biases. We, we are born with biases. We grow into biases. I have biases. And I consider myself a social justice advocate and warrior. Uh, but I acknowledge that I have privilege and that I have biases and, and that's okay. Uh, and I am learning and as we learn, as Maya Angelou says, once you know better, you do better. So uh, getting comfortable with that. And a big piece of this uh, acknowledging, uh, number one, is that we have so much to unlearn. We want our students to be critical thinkers. We want them to question. We want them to think for themselves. And we, wanna fo we want to foster those same ideas with our teachers, our staff, our principals, our administrators, is that uh, we acknowledge that we've learned and that that isn't working for everybody. And in order to change that, we have to be willing to unlearn and uh, move forward. Um, we can do better. I wholeheartedly believe that. I believe that educators, 99.999% uh, of us, want the best for our students. And if in any way uh, we, we understand that not everybody has uh, gotten uh, what they deserve, then um, I'm sure that we, we jump at the opportunity to create that change. So that first strategy is really to acknowledge that um, there's work to do and that it's systemic and that it's bigger than this moment, that it has existed, it is part of our history, it is part of history that we haven't shared with, with others, and it's time for us to do that. So let's acknowledge and unlearn and learn together. The second strategy for me is um, declaring solidarity. Declaring this idea that yes, I understand and I am committing to learning. I am uh, committed to uh, creating change with my team and that I am willing to be more than just an ally. So the way I see it, an ally is that very first initial step where you empathize, where you know that there is a problem, where you are ready to create changes as a result. Um, haven't done it, you've declared it, you've stated it, you may have even tweeted about it, you may have even shared uh, with your um, staff some initial ideas, some initial conversations, some book studies, and so forth. Uh, but we want to get to the next level, and that next level is becoming a co-conspirator. Um, I had a friend describe it, um, her name is Kelly, describe it as, you know, having that one person that not only goes on the, on the spree with you, crime spree, 
a shopping spree, whatever you want to call it. Um, but that then hel helps you hide the evidence, right? Uh, so the co-conspirator um, not only um, talks about it, but does something about it. So they're the person that is arm in arm with you, that is bringing up conversations, um, that is determined uh, to create uh, more opportunities for change in the schoolroom, in the schoolhouse, in the classroom, in the boardroom, whether it is uh, your executive cabinet or your leadership team, uh, and that a co-conspirator says things out loud, and they are respectful, and they are factual, and they all are about a goal of creating some common understandings and some learning for everybody. Uh, part of that leadership role is not only learning about things and words like uh, anti-racism and culturally responsive teaching and um, abolitionist, uh, but actually uh, creating changes in our systems. And so going beyond the learning of words into implementing for action. And that begins with declaring. And not being there is okay. Uh, wanting to grow from not being there is a must. And then the hardest part, um, I'm in California and um, Historically, we, we haven't always had the best funding for our students. We haven't always invested uh, resources into our school communities. Uh, I think more uh, states and more districts are falling into that same experience. But not only do we have to think about investing our time, right, because that's the most precious thing that we have, but look at what and how we are investing in our uh, very own schools, in our districts, in our classrooms. And that includes human resources and fiscal resources. Um, as a principal, I worked in a school district that uh, our work focused on the whole community. We didn't just focus on the whole child, but we focused on the whole community. And part of that was addressing the social emotional uh, learning pieces, uh, those basic needs, uh, Maslow before Bloom, uh, to support our students in our learning. And my school, Title I school, 85% free and reduced, 40% English learners, we created some amazing opportunities by investing in resources. So every site, our superintendent um, invested in full-time social workers at every school site, a full-time reading specialist, full-time math specialist, full-time English learner specialist. And in California especially, uh, that's not a luxury that we've always had. But being able to declare as a district that this is important and this is how we will meet the needs of our whole community and this is worth investing in, protecting that investment and growing and building um, capital across the district based on that investment created real change. And uh, once a year testing, uh, our statewide testing is just one measure of what our students are able to do. We understand that, but our, our students were scoring at, at high levels, especially our English learners and our Afri African-American student groups. And I truly believe that that came about as a result of that common agreement, that acknowledgement uh, the investment in school culture, the investment in uh, the whole child and the whole community, and the investment not only in people, but in programs or products or instruction or PD uh, that had that laser-like focus on uh, the heart and the brain.
So we didn't want to just feed the mind, we wanted to feed the heart. Uh, and, and I know that some of those things are beyond our control uh, because it's not like that in every district, but I think that is the goal, investing in those things that support all of our students, not just some of our students. And a big part of that was really looking at data because in some districts you may, uh, I, I remember with No Child Left Behind, um, I worked in, in a school where um, students were scoring, scoring in the 90th percentile. But when we broke down the data and we had a better understanding of who those students were, not all students were making progress. To the outside world, it looked like things were great, but with NCLB, we were forced to look at individual groups and it demonstrated that we were leaving many of our students behind. Um, and so that is a great opportunity to begin to invest in um, change. Um, my recommendations for real change, learn as much as you can, fill your backpack, uh, own that opportunity of, of leadership, whether it's a formal leadership position or an informal position. Uh, understand what your influence is. It's a great influence. Um, and more than anything, everyday actions, what you do on a daily basis is having an impact. What you say, what you don't say. I can't imagine going back in, in the fall, um, whether it's virtually or not, and not addressing what's happening in the nation as it uh, impacts our students of color, our communities of color. Whether it's COVID and uh, the number of people of color who are impacted, or whether it is inequity in learning and inequity in access to learning for communities of color and students in poverty. I can't imagine jumping in and not talking about it. And so planning for those things and realizing that what you do on a daily basis, as small as it may be, if it's chipping away at inequity in our systems, then you're doing the right work every day, every day. Um, I mentioned Dr. Anthony Muhammad, and uh, you know he's not paying me money, um, but I read his work and it changed what I did as a new principal. And it greatly impacted school culture and relationships and culture are everything. I couldn't have done any of the other work to address the needs of my whole community if we didn't have a, a healthy culture that addressed uh, needs, that addressed um, the elephants in the room, and that addressed inequity. And so I'm very thankful to his work, but this is one of my latest reads was Time for Change. And it really is written for leaders who, who are looking to create um, more changes in their, at their school sites. Um, Sorry, let's see, there we go. Where do you begin, you're wondering? <laughs> Where do you begin? It begins with you. I wrote a piece called Mirror Check. And um, sometimes as a partner, as a parent, I look at creating change for everybody else, right? I want, I wish my husband did more of this or less of this. I wish my kids did more of this or less of that. But actually taking the mirror and looking at what I can do to become a better partner, a better parent, a better friend uh, is a little harder. And uh, it's same thing with the, the changes that we wanna see is it really, as corny as it sounds, it begins with you. And what are you willing to change about yourself? What do you believe? Analyzing those beliefs and biases and modeling. And then what, what's worth fighting for? What do you stand for? Where do you draw the line? What will you do for children? What are you willing to change about yourself and what are you willing to bring to your team? Understanding what those things are 
is the beginning of that change. Uh, I, I challenge you to think about what you're prepared to do. And again, we have informal leaders, we have formal leaders, and uh, you are the leaders of your classrooms and your schools, and you have to ask yourself that question. I literally had to write those things out. It provided clarity for me uh, about my beliefs and what I was willing uh, to, to achieve and what are the goals that I wanted to put in place for myself as a leader uh, uh, of a school, but as a leader for equity and social justice in my community. Here are a few strategies for leaders. Some of these I've mentioned, model, people are watching what you say, what you do, as well as what you don't do and what you don't say. So be very mindful of that. Uh, I wrote a piece on the myth of color blindness and that scratches the surface and it helps us understand the importance of valuing who our children are, what they bring to the table, and that includes language, race, experiences, gender, all of it. Uh, the myth of color blindness gives you more perspectives on that. Relationships matter. I know we talk about it. It's a slogan, it's a bumper sticker. Building strong relationships and building a healthy school culture is a lot of work. And uh, it's, it's important. It's the foundation to everything else. Regular merit checks, not only for you, but for your team. What do you believe in? Where can we have really transparent and honest conversations about the things about ourselves that we'd like to change and, and, and grow um, in ourselves? And courageous conversations. I'm really working to not use that term um, because I look forward to a day when those conversations are just conversations. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, if we wait for, for the right comfort level to jump into some of those harder conversations and the harder work, then we're, we're gonna be waiting forever. And this moment, will pass us by and we will look back and say, remember 2020, we had an opportunity to revamp and change uh, our systems uh, to work for all children. Remember to make data informed decisions. Uh, as a new principal, it's hard to come in and say, hey, these are the things we gotta work on. Come on, let's do it. When you're using data and the, and you're bringing your, your PLC, your learning communities together to look at that together, the data, it just doesn't lie. So it's a great segue into having those harder conversations. And I, I do believe that the experts are in the room and that we are stronger together. Uh, so investing in your learning communities and giving your teachers the time to build and to work together as a learning community and, and build some commitments. It, it's just like anything else. If, if I wanna you know, buy a new car, I'm gonna have to set some goals and, and commit to saving some money and, and giving up a few things. Um, same thing in, in our work is you have to be able to look at where you are and where you wanna get to and build some commitments together that everybody supports. So I bring us back to those three strategies for leaders, acknowledge, declare, and not only invest, but disrupt. Disruption doesn't have to be a negative word. Disruption is, is uh, a powerful tool that we can use uh, to bring about the change that we expect to see. So leaders, acknowledge, declare your solidarity, get to work, disrupt, and make some investments. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing.
Dr. Perez Isaiah, wow, I don't know about you all, but my cup is full. <laughs> and that re-energized me. And I'm excited about the work that we have ahead of us. Just some key points I kind of took away. I have four or five pages, but be, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and as an educator, recognizing that our system is not set up for students of color to always be successful. So how are we bridging the gap to make that happen? Um, go beyond being an ally. I mean, being an ally is great, doing a book study, book study is great, but going beyond that and understanding that you have a greater role for that. Um, investing not only time and funding, but also making sure that you have the right people in place with human capital and making sure those people are for your children. Focus not only on the whole child, but focus on the whole community. And that was, that was key. Um, when you're doing, when you're leading, leading schools and looking at data, drill down to see what your subgroups are saying. Not only the, the, the overall hierarchy umbrella, but what are the subgroups saying about your kids and how they're being successful. And then uh, in order to see real change, learn, lead, then lead the change, and then see the action every day. And I'll leave with be the mirror, be the change you want to see, and be a disruptor. Wherever you are, whatever capacity you're in, be the disruptor that you want to see in the world and make that change happen with you. Uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Rosa, for that that enlightening keynote this afternoon. We're excited like to hear that. Thank you, I Basil. Nice little, to meet you, by the way. Yes, I think, person. <laughs> and I think we all need to do a quick virtual round of applause. Thank you so much, Rosa. Thank you. Rosa. That was phenomenal. Thank you. Lots of shouts in the chat there, too.